Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast with Rod Dreer. I am your host, Kale Zeldin, and uh, we are back with Rod today. Rod, you've been, again, back in Italy. Um, how you been? What's going on? How you feeling? Buonasera. Ah, I've wrapped buonasera. myself in the flag of the Venetian Republic, Kale, which uh, one of the, the, the groups I spoke to in uh, Verona gave me as a, as a lovely parting gift. Um, fair, fair Verona uh, uh, of, uh, of yes. Romeo and Juliet fame. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually love Verona. Yeah. Um, it was, I've never been before. It was so beautiful, but yeah. it had been part of the Venetian Republic and uh, people I talked to were are very proud of that. And of rightly it. so. And anyway, it was a great time in Italy. Got back um, as we're talking, I got back last night to, Beautiful Baton Rouge, our hometown, yours and mine. Now, how are things there? It's, things are very bad We've had here. Quite, quite a few weeks here, haven't we? Yeah, we really have. I was in Italy when the hurricane hit and had to realize that maybe it wasn't the best idea to text pictures of me eating gelato on the Piazza Navona uh, to my wife and kids back home uh, who are bearing down, hiding in the hallway yeah. from the rim. But uh, it was, they, they made it out okay. But man, the city is so yeah. beat down now. Even yeah. still, I, I took my clean, my dry cleaner in today and normally it takes a day. She goes, yeah, we won't be able to get this back to you for next week because so many people right are down still yeah, yeah. and um the, you know then it goes off the news right away the thing passes by and yeah you know we, we don't talk about it anymore at a national level but yeah down here a lot of people are still really hurting I, I was really shocked to be honest yeah my folks uh you know were out were were okay in terms of their house you know they didn't get any damage or flooding their, their house is a little high up for baton rouge standards but they were out, they were without power for close to a week and um fortunately they're very kind and generous next door neighbor has a generator. So my mom and dad were able to run a, a line for their freezer and their refrigerator. So they did have food. Uh, they have gas, they have a gas stove. So they had food, but you know, dad's 80, mom's 77, I think. And, you know, a week in at the end of August without air conditioning in South Louisiana is really, uh, you know, I frankly would, would, would have a hard time making it. So, you know, I told my mom and dad, I said, look, next time something like that's coming up the teeth of Baton Rouge, you're just going to come on up here and, and, and weather it out with me. Because it's just, you know, as uh, as uh, Danny Glover would say in, in Lethal Weapon, you know, they're getting too old for this shit. So I just it, <laughs> it's tough. I mean, and, you know, it's interesting from my perspective as someone who used to live there and has lived through these things, you know, they don't go away. Like from my perspective up here, like Ida's like way last week ago. Right. And it's uh, the, the, the cleanups and the, and the long-term effects of these things are pretty, are pretty staggering actually. Yeah. Yeah. And we're a poor state here too. Yep. I mean, it's, you really do uh, realize, and this is kind of a philosophical point mm -hmm. about how accustomed we are in modernity to things moving at the pace of the media in the sense that, okay, that was, Ida was so last week, let's move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Let's well, not so last week for a heck of a lot of people in this part of the world. And I did not realize, for example, that the city of Homa, which is right on the coast has been uh, heavily damaged, maybe even partly destroyed. As, as has, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just just uh, east of of Louisiana in in southern Mississippi, they have, they got devastated again too. And you know, again, New Orleans gets the coverage right because it's New Orleans, which makes a certain uh -huh. amount of sense. But you know, nobody outside of Louisiana or southern Mississippi knows what Homa is. You know, right, nobody right. knows what Cocodri is or any of these sort of these these towns that are south of New Orleans. And they had there's there's no break for those folks. And you know, one of the things that really kind of was really ticking me off, Rod. Um, as I was following the whole thing, I don't watch TV. I don't watch the, the, the tele, certainly don't watch televised news or anything like that. But I was on the Twitter, which is my, which is my fault, of course. But on the Twitter, you know, you got all these people who don't, aren't from Louisiana, don't live up there. They most of them live up, live up here, frankly. And they're like, well, why are people, why aren't people just leaving? Like, what, you know, what, what, how hard is it to leave? And you just, you just, the, the, the staggering level of sort of, um, well, it's just a lack of charity and understanding. It's like, yeah. you just just leave, you know, because you so, can yeah, just what's leave. wrong? We shouldn't have to pay for right. you people to, you know, and and somebody on Twitter from Los Angeles said that. And I said, oh, that's really interesting when you um, 
when when the big one hits out there yeah. and most mm-hmm. of your city is lying in ruins, I'll remember that you think that the rest of you don't owe us anything. Right. Actually, no, we will come to your aid because that's what decent people do. Of and we're not yelling at you now to move. Yeah. Um, you know, you know plus, I, go ahead. it's just very frustrating, right? I mean, you know, and you, you've lived around the country as have I, and, and, that, and look, uh, you and I are, we're not sentimentalist about where we're from. I mean, you know, I love Louisiana. I'm, I can see the warts. I can see the problems. I can see all those sort of things, but it's a great place with great people. And to, to, to see them maligned just like nobody's business on Twitter and other places online is very frustrating when they're going through real, 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 real tough things. Oh yeah. And you know, these jackasses act like poor people can just pick up and move. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so many of the people in our state, black, white, whatever, are poor and are just living paycheck to paycheck. And where would they go anyway? Right. You know, this is home for them. Well, th- well, think about it this way, Rod. Okay, so let's say um, that a uh, 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 hurricane's coming up, coming up the coast and it's going to hit Rhode Island Square because I'm I live on the island part of Rhode Island. Let's say I have to evacuate, so I evacuate somewhere I don't know, somewhere in Connecticut or you know inland, right? Um, you know, you got to figure, uh, it's going to be, you know, about a hundred bucks a night, um, for a hotel room, maybe, maybe more cause I'm a family and you've got, you know, it's a hundred dollars a day to eat, you know, in no time you're a thousand dollars in and you, do you just have a thousand dollars laying around? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you frozen again. Well, it's, it's a, such a good look. We'll just keep going and see, see what happens here. Okay. Uh, so, you know, but no, that, that's, that's the frustration, you know, it's like, you can't just get up and, you know, you know, you know, now a lot of this of course is driven by folks who, for instance, during the, 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 the COVID lockdowns could just leave their apartments in New York city and go to one of their other homes and ride out the lockdowns, right, right. you know, as if they're on some sort of perpetual vacation. And look, I, I don't envy anybody their success or anything like that, but man, friggin' get a perspective and have a clue about it because yeah. not everybody, you know, certainly not a ton of people down in South Louisiana have a, a second house that they can just pick up and go to. It's just uh-huh. ridiculous. Well, I'm glad we got that out of our system. Yes, because um, I'm angry. Do, you know? do, do you know when, when I was in Italy, I met the Pope? Yeah, Rod, you met the Pope. What happened? Now, I've, <laughs> I've, I've heard about this. I've heard that, that that you actually got to shake his hand. Is that correct? Yeah, I was part of an event over there uh, where they ended up taking a big group of us over to the Vatican for a private audience with the Pope and we stood in line and uh, we each yeah. got to shake his hand and uh, we had, we're wearing name tags. I got up there in front of him and I said, uh, shook his hand and said, Holy Father, I wrote the Benedict option. <laughs> and he grabs my uh, my name tag and reads it and looks oh. up at me just very blankly and, and stiffly. And uh, yeah. anyway, and I walked on, but I, I made the mistake of tweeting about this. Uh, I, I tweeted, uh, I just said what happened. At the, yeah, you know, I remember the, the tweets and I remember uh, kind of chuckling about it myself. Boy, it, I was so dumb to have done that because what I, it didn't occur to me is that uh, most people have no idea of the backstory here. When I went to Italy four years ago, um, on the promotion for the Benedict option, Benedict right? option. Yeah, no, it was okay. three years ago. Yeah, it's Italy promoting the Benedict option. Somebody in the Vatican, my publishers wouldn't tell me who, maybe they don't know who, but somebody in the Vatican called around to the different dioceses in Italy saying, don't welcome Roger into your diocese. His book is anti-Francis. Well, the book is not anti-Francis. It Francis isn't even nothing, in the book. It has absolutely nothing to do with Francis. Yeah, I think this was probably the Jesuit father, Antonio Spadaro, but ah, yeah. um, but I because he's he was the one leading a big campaign against the book saying just insane things about it, but I can't right. prove it was him. Anyway, um, Cardinal Cafara, the Archbishop of Genoa, refused right. to do this, and he, he welcomed me there, bought a copy of the book for each one of his priests. Mm-hmm. And even Archbishop, now Cardinal Zuppi of Bologna, he's a man of the left, the church right. left, but he said, forget it, we're going to have him here. And he appeared with me on stage. I thanked him very much at the time for his right. courage. Yeah. Anyway, um, it was just ridiculous, and all kinds of stuff was going around there. My friends who are in the Vatican Press Corps were telling me at the time that you know, the people around Francis are obsessed with this book. Yeah. So, well, 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 you know, so what's funny to me about that is that, you know, I think people oftentimes forget 
that even for a large international uh, operation like the like the Roman Catholic Church, you know, at the end of it, you have a, a small coterie of people who actually like run the whole thing. And, right. and you know, I, I certainly have seen evidence over the years, like, you know, they we're all we all sort of read and interact in a lot of the same circles yeah you know, not me i'm just a sort of a bit player observing from 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 the fringes but you know but but cer but certain people that i saw commenting on twitter and elsewhere were like oh rod you know like the pope even knows this sort of stuff and, and i just laughed i mean that's all you can do it's like yeah yeah well i, I set myself up for that because i yeah. i didn't i i, I love my head was in such the circle here that as soon as i tweeted that i heard from vatican people I know saying, oh, and I would have loved to have seen that because they know perfectly well that the yeah. Pope knows who I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he didn't before, after Archbishop Gainsfine, the private secretary to Benedict XVI, Gainsfine gave a speech on that same tour uh, in Rome. Right. He gave a talk about the book and uh, the Vatican press corps people told me whatever Gainsfine says, you know, Benedict approved every syllable. And so That's I was really nervous because Pope Benedict is a, a real hero of mine. And sure. I, if he had not liked the book, I'm a big boy, I could have taken it, but it would have been kind of hard. But in fact, Gainsfine praised the book to the skies. And right. when he when he left the room, my journalist friends who were covering it said, oh, this is going to set off a bomb among Francis's <laughs> people. So point is, Francis's people know who I am. No big deal. But I but it was I, I was like, oh, Rod, you Claude, why did you tweet yeah. that? Because yeah. no, I, I didn't talk about all this stuff on my blog about all the weird politics uh, of mm -hmm. of this um, and suddenly now I have to. And no, oh, this guy, uh, uh, who is that clown? Austin Ruse. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Ruse. Yes. Yeah, he's a um, you know professional Catholic, uh, right wing Catholic. I've known him for twenty years, and he's kind of like a, a failed oyster. You know, he has an irritation, <laughs> deep irritation, with no resulting <laughs> pearl. He jumped me, jumped on me about about this, and you know, here's here's a guy who. You know, it's it was so pitiful. He wrote about it in Crisis Magazine. This guy is right. so professionally jealous. It's it's it was funny, but I got to say, I, I brought all this on myself by um, and uh, I regret doing it. But I met the Pope, and he knows who he met, and say la vie. Sure, you know there there it is, right there it is. Yeah. All right, so you you meet with the Pope. Um, can you tell us anything about what this gathering was, or is that sort of like an off off off? It, it's all Topic, sort of thing. rules, which means I can't talk about it. But sure. there's people there from all over the world, mm -hmm. um, not just Catholics. But Obviously. I did um, have an interesting conversation with some Africans, African lawmakers who happened to be there, all Catholics. Okay. And um, they were talking about how uh, much the, the status of the United States is declining in Africa, for a couple of reasons, but the most mm -hmm. important one being that they said that U.S. diplomacy and uh, including aid diplomacy it has been for the past few years increasingly contingent on Africans adopting pro-LGBT policies. And they were we saying that this is so strongly against the ethos in African countries. Well, well how, how does that work exactly? What, what do you mean that it's tied to LGBT initiatives. I'm not sure I, I follow. Um, yeah. Well, from what from what I can recall from the conversation, uh -huh. they were saying that like things, uh, and it's not only from uh, American the American government, but from NGOs, okay. contingent on uh, Africans passing laws, pro LGBT laws, pro LGBT policies, and mm -hmm. you know some of the stuff that's come out of Africa has been harsher than you or I would 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 prove up like some of the the, the anti-lgbt laws sure, but, of course but you know what this is um but the, the africans feel that this is cultural imperialism and they're right and they said too that uh, in nigeria um th these weren't nigerians i was talking to but they said that in nigeria it's particularly bad because um in nigeria they're facing a civil war boko haram the islamic yeah. uh, terrorist group it's a real mess a yeah, yeah yeah and um was attacking Christians there. And I can remember a few years ago, Cale, uh, there was a, 
there was a lot of journalism about Archbishop Peter Akinola, who was the head of the Anglican Church in, in Nigeria. Yeah. And there are more Anglicans in Nigeria than in England. By England, the way, right. Today. Certainly practicing. <laughs> yeah, and Akinola was making the argument that the uh, Anglican, worldwide Anglican Church's pro gay activism was being used against the Anglicans in Nigeria by Muslims oh, uh, who were who were <clears throat> taunting Christians, saying that look at the church, look at what they accept, blah blah blah. So this is a real thing for them. But it, mm-hmm. but to the West, according to these lawmakers, to the West, you know, we we suddenly decided uh, that LGBT is the most important thing in the world, and we have to even withhold food aid and development aid, make it contingent on. LGBT stuff, and um, that was that was really something else. And I, and I was talking about it with some other Catholics from from Western Europe yeah. there. And and at further meetings I had after I left this meeting on my book tour, just going around Italy, I heard the same thing over and over again. I mean, people kept pointing out how the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See flew the Pride flag, and these Italians took it again correctly as a real swipe at the catholic church and a disrespect for the catholic church you know it reminds me rod you know what of a couple of episodes ago we were talking about afghanistan and in and, and and the the famous sort of a tweet uh seen around the world from the the embassy in kabul i believe it was kabul right and you know with the pride flag um you know and that this sort of this sort of wonderful moment of of, of, of cultural uh, ascendancy for, um, for the movement, as it were. And, you know, uh, I, we asked the question, I think I asked the question at the time, well, you know, what are you, what are you hoping to achieve with this sort of um, signaling, you know, this sort of tweeting? And, you know, it, it would seem that, that, that the elites, uh, you know, well, I shouldn't say, I use the, that word a little bit loosely, but the people who staff and run our embassies, the ruling class, the ruling class, thank you. Yeah, believe that this is the best way to advance the interests of our country and our partnerships, if I'm understanding what an embassy is for correctly. And I'm just not sure how this advances. <laughs> our mutual interest. I, again, I'm just curious. I mean, how, how, yeah. how do they see this as working? You know, well, I, I was sitting in Rome one night um, after I finished the meeting and started the book tour. I was having dinner with some journalists and one of them said he had just, he and his family two weeks earlier had been in the south of France on vacation mm-hmm. and in their little village, there was an, there was an in France, there was an annual uh, cel- a ceremony to celebrate the Allied, Allied invasion the south of France to liberate France from the Nazis. Right. And they do this every year. Um, and uh, this year, the U.S. Uh, embassy or a consulate sent a, a consular official there to give a talk. And the American woman talked about, you know, amazing thing, courage, fighting the Nazis, fighting for freedom. And then she said, and that's this is why today we fight for LGBT rights. And, and the Italian said he was like, wait, what? Yeah. Wait, what? 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 And so, I mean, but this is a U.S. government official likening the liberation of Europe from the Nazis to the LGBT rights. I mean, it's, but this right. is, I, I think, honestly, Kale, this is how the ruling class thinks about this stuff. It's, it's got to be, right? I mean, it's got to be. I mean, so like what, you I mean, look, you know, like what would your, what would your progressive friends in the, in the media class say to our befuddlement at this, do you think? Bigots, you deserve it. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing is, right. um, one thing that really surprised me, uh, and I, I didn't think I was capable of being surprised like this, but traveling yeah. around Italy and for on this book tour, and I ended up talking to a lot of like normie conservatives, usually my, uh, my European circles are or a journalist or think tank people sure, on the right, right on right. the Christian right. Yeah. But I, this time I talked to some normally conservatives and what really stood out to me was how angry they are at what they consider to be American cultural imperialism. Mm. And they mentioned, God, man, Netflix came up a lot. I didn't realize Netflix was available in Europe, but they talked about it constantly about how they believe these are, mind you, Catholic conservatives I'm talking to, yeah. they, they see Netflix uh, and other forms of American popular culture as uh, undermining their 
their traditions, their religion, mm -hmm. uh, their, and, and they're completely right. I, I talked to one woman in Hungary. I, I made a little side trip to Hungary this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, somebody I didn't even know over there, but we found mm -hmm. ourselves standing around a table uh, at an event drinking wine. And sure. she was talking about how her 19 year old son, uh, she just didn't understand him. Uh, he asked her, mom, have you ever kissed a girl? And she, she wanted to slap him. For right, it. Right, right. But uh, and he said, well, no, you shouldn't be offended. Uh, all, of, all of us and his peer group are fooling around with same sex experimentation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, she went on to say, she goes, you know, my son for the past two or three years, he, has on, he only reads in, and listens and watches to English language um, programming oh, yeah, and all yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And she said, this stuff is all coming from Anglo the Anglo-Saxon world. Right. And uh, it was striking to hear her say this and to, to see the confusion and the anger in her voice that she feels like I were, I'm losing my son because of you. Uh, you Americans. Like you she Americans. knows that I don't agree with that, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. All, all of this cumulatively, Kale, made me uh, made me realize that we used to be seen as liberators over there, and people still really admire America, but that's fading fast. And uh, in Italy, I heard actually some conservative Italians speaking well of Putin mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because of all this, and it it just. I, I, we are so blind. You know, we, in our American media, we don't even know these people exist in Europe, these normie conservatives. We only ever hear about people like the Box Party in Spain or right. Lega or the uh, Fratelli d'Italia in, in Italy or the uh, Orban's party in Hungary as the right. far right. Actually, they represent the mainstream, right? The kind of people that our journalists upon and our academics, upon whom we in America depend to get a, a sense of Europe, we never hear. And this is why I thought it was so important for um, for Tucker Carlson to have gone to Hungary, um, because for the first time, the American people got from an American journalist an alternative view of what is happening in Hungary and by extension among the right in Europe. Well, you know, what's so interesting to me about this phenomena is that I, you know, again, all the, the, the people who get really mad at Tucker Carlson, for instance, it's funny to kind of watch this again from the sidelines because, you know, Tucker's in many respects, one of them, you know, he, went to boarding school and he went to the colleges and, you know, he's sort of, he's part of that world. I mean, raised that, in Washington, DC. Yeah. You know, he's part of that world. And, and, and yet I think the reason why there's so much vitriol for him in particular, um, and I'm probably talking here a little bit more about Twitter than anywhere else, but fine. Um, is that it's almost like, they're angry at him because he's not read the memos that the yeah. Overton window has shifted to the left. And he, he sort of plays, he plays with them a little bit about this, but, but really getting back to this idea, like what is an acceptable frame with which to have respectful conversations, respectful uh -huh. arguments, respectful legislation, respectful measures, education, you know, it's shifted so decidedly and massively to the left. Um, and then we know this, right? I mean, you, I remember a couple of years ago, you were, um, there was some screenshots of graphs and charts about just how much like Republicans or the right has basically stayed the same yeah, in terms yeah. of positions. And the, the Democratic left has, has really uh, 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 substantially moved to the left. And, and so, so with them goes that Overton window. And yeah. I think that that has gone such a has done such a number in terms of our perceptions about what people think and what's normal and what's what's beyond the pale and you know all of those things I think our, our categories are are outworn um, and I worry honestly as someone who's not uh, you know employed in the professional conservative you know sort of reactionary journalistic space. Um, like, like, like me, like you, right. And, yeah, and, and you know, your friends, I mean, I'm friends with you, but I'm not part of that world. I'm just a, a teacher. Um, I wonder how much you, uh, and I'm not pointing my finger at you, Rod Dreer, but you and your friends and those people who, you know, you might have, you know, uh, 
comfortable, genteel disagreements with Ross or, you know, whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. I'm always wondering, how much do you all understand how much the Overton window has shifted under your feet? You know, that's actually a good question. I, I, I don't know, because I p part of my problem in, in, in the terms of answering that question is that I have been working for, from home for 10 years. Yeah. Um, and I live in a really conservative part of the country, yeah. but, um, you yeah, but, but it's not consistently conservative. I mean, I, I think that you know, from what I hear anecdotally, uh, generation Z here in my own town and in, in South Louisiana is way, way to the left of where, in what way. Where, yeah. That's interesting. It's like, in what way, like, so like gay marriage or like, what, what, what are you talking about? Gender and, and homosexuality. I mean, so, I, so gender I, identity I, issues, sexual yeah, issues. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's, but um, but but it's also true too that I I don't really, whenever I get together socially, unless I know the people really well, mm -hmm. I never talk about this stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. I would have done it before, just as normal conversation. But now people are so hot headed, and you don't know where it's going to go. I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely an outlier because I've. I'm very public in my views and chances are, if you know who I am and want to sit down with me, you know what you're going to get. So I yeah. don't have to really have to worry, but um, it was really striking to me being in Europe um, and just having the same kind of conversation, every city I would go, yeah. go to how um, even in Europe, when, where there's, there are pretty strong divisions. Yeah. Still doesn't seem to be the same sort of hysteria and you know country on the verge of a nervous breakdown mm -hmm. uh, reality that we're dealing with here in America. It it's it's really really something. But um, you know I I, I have you're talking about the Overton window. I noticed that as you and I are talking today, Tucker Carlson is getting a lot of criticism, or at least uh, people talking about him on Twitter for having had Curtis Yarvin, Mencius Mulbug, the new oh. neo reactionary guy on his Tucker's show, his, his interview show. And uh, frankly, you know, I, I've read some of Mincia Smallbug. I don't agree with a lot of it, but he's an interesting figure. And yeah. I'm glad Tucker is bringing him into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, But it, the fact that so many on the left are freaking out about this made me realize that I'm probably going to get uh, just a, a storm of uh, indignation when the New Yorker piece on me and Hungary and Viktor Orban comes mm -hmm. out soon, it's, you know, it should come out. It might come out as soon as tomorrow, which would be Friday. What uh, do What do you think? What What do you think is in there that's going to maybe blow up a little bit? Oh, I, the usual stuff. Like he's a fascist. He's a this. And I let me say here. I mean, again, yeah. not having seen the piece, I suspect that the reporter Ben Wallace Wells will do a fair job. Mm -hmm. He did a fair job writing about Christopher Rufo and Sora Bamari. I expect he'll be fair, but I think it's a substance of the positions I take that's going to cause the the blow up. But um, he he wrote me when I was in Italy. He uh, mm -hmm. uh, earlier this week he wrote me saying that he had a few follow up questions because he had talked to some liberal critics of Orban and wanted to send me some follow up questions. Yeah. I told him that I was actually out of, uh, of telephone range, which was true. And could he send them by email? And I answered sure. him. Sure. But, uh, and I, I did the usual thing I do. I wrote like thousands and thousands of words. <laughs> but yes. it, here's the thing, though. I, I realized and I brought this up that every criticism that the American left makes of Orban, you can throw it back on them times 100. You know, that they're. they're they were what do you talking mean? about put, put some meat on those. All right, all right. Some meat on that example, yeah. example. They were talking about how Orban persecutes academics. I guess what they're talking about is the fact that the Orban government effectively drove George Soros's university out of Budapest. Right. Um, and I I would have uh, I would have in principle objections to that. Mm -hmm. Although having mm -hmm. seen how what the woke wokeness has done to American <laughs> academia, what woke academia is doing to the Amer to, to America itself. I have a lot more sympathy for Orban than I normally would. Yeah. Nevertheless, you know, I, I said, wait, they're concerned about that when look at what is happening in every damn university, it seems, in this country. Well, and you just Joshua, tweeted out you just tweeted out yesterday, I tweeted out you you blogged out about Peter Bogosian. Peter Bogosian at Portland State having mm -hmm. to re resigning and saying in his resignation letter the incredible, unspeakable harassment that he's received on campus and that the, the administration has let happen because even though he's a left-wing atheist, 
he is anti-woke and that's yep. intolerable. Or what's happening, this is what I told the, the, um, the New Yorker because yeah. Bogosian hadn't, hadn't re resigned yet. Right. I talked about Joshua Katz at Princeton. Oh, yes, he's, yes. You know, this poor guy, you know, he's a tenured professor of classics, well-respected. He's now been made a hate figure by the administration at Princeton because he opposed um, a woke activist critical race theory group yeah. and it said so publicly. Now, Princeton Greg, I mean, has, just, just for our audience, if you didn't read Rod's piece on this earlier, they have basically made him the poster child of evil yep. on campus, like literally using his picture, literally using things he said, I think, in some promotional pieces to their incoming freshmen yep. about how here at Princeton, you know, we we stand against hate or, you know, whatever, you know, the, yep. the yep. standard yep. boilerplate. Yep. Yeah, they used him, and he's a tenured one of their tenured professors. They've used him as sort of, you know, uh, basically there's a portrait of Hitler right here, and like, yeah, see that? We hate that. Here's the one. Here's the guy. Go get him. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. And I hope I, I bet he would have a lawsuit there. I hope he sues them. But anyway, this sort of thing is happening constantly in this country. And uh, one of the things that just riles me up about this is that this is the whole soft totalitarianism yeah. thing is that the left in charge of institutions, they have such hegemony within these institutions that they don't even know what they're doing. And um, the, the, the upshot how, how, of all- How can you say that? They don't know what they're doing. I want, I want, I want to push back on that. I, not that I necessarily disagree with you, but mm -hmm. um, you, were, you, you just said that the left has, um, the leftist hegemony on college campuses at the elitist of the elite levels, mm -hmm. we're talking about Princeton here, so it's in the conversation, right? Um, that they don't know what they're doing. I, I, as as an I'm... outsider, as an academically minded outsider, <laughs> I'm not sure I follow what you mean by that. Okay, yeah, I think that's a good point. First of all, I think they do know what they're doing, what they're trying to to do to rid the world of evil, and they don't think it's bad if they're doing it for the cause of righteousness, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. which they are. But when I say they don't know what they're doing, I, I'm speaking to something that I've, I've long said about the left, that mm -hmm. with its constant pushing of racial consciousness, that it's mm -hmm. calling up demons on the far right, the white supremacist right. I see. And, and it's not even aware of this. But I think also going back to Afghanistan, I think about people like the man I was back in 2001, 2002, in the march up to uh, to Iraq, hmm. there were people who said, we don't want to do this. You, you get rid of Saddam. He's a bad guy, but get rid of Saddam. Hmm. And there's going to be the war of all, uh, all against all. There's going to be et, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't see that. I saw this as, nope, this is America going in to stand up for human rights, for hmm. freedom, for hmm. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I didn't right. know what we were doing. That doesn't release me from culpability and people sure. like me from culpability, but I'm just saying that we were so blinded by our, our own sense of righteousness that we didn't understand the full the fullness of what what we were doing. And I think the same thing is happening okay. now with with the left. It doesn't get them off the hook, but I think when you are only surrounded by people who tell you what you want to hear, when you make it too dangerous for people to contradict you, you're in trouble. I go back to a story I, I've told on my blog. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever talked about it. Um, when I was in Russia uh, doing reporting for Live Not By Lies, I was having dinner with a family and uh, the father of the family um, told me that he remembers when he knew the Soviet Union was going to fall. Do you know the story I'm talking about? I know the story, but you have not talked about it on the okay. show. So I think this okay. is a good opportunity to, to resurrect yeah. the story. I he was, uh, it was... 1980, the Moscow Olympics in 1980, and he was a brand new graduate of film school. And he'd gotten a job working on the crew to the Soviet TV crew to sure. produce the Moscow Olympics. And uh, they were setting up lighting <laughs> in the, the VIP box where Brezhnev and all the top, the polar bureau were going to be gathered for the opening ceremony. You know, you know, I got to say, I kind of miss Brezhnev and the boys just as a, as a <laughs> visual counterpoint to Reagan. I just, you know, it's a shame. Yeah, it's yeah. a shame. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Anyway, so <laughs> they, they were setting up the lighting for all this. And um, suddenly the, the KGB advance crew burst in, you know, they're trying to clear it, make sure it's safe for Brezhnev. And they see him hanging up pipes there. And they said, you got to take those down. We didn't agree to that. They said, but sirs, we, we can't take it down. We need that for the lighting. The, the, the general secretary will not be well lit if this 
isn't there. They said, doesn't matter. We didn't agree to it. Take it down. Oh, no. Well, they were too afraid to argue because this was the KGB. Yeah. So they took it down. And uh, so when the opening ceremonies start, broadcast worldwide, there's a general secretary in the Politburo in the dark, you know, because of what the KGB did. And the guy told me, uh, the, the father said, that's when I knew that we were doomed in this country. The system was doomed because... Yeah. We knew what we were talking about, that we were going to make the general secretary look bad, but we were all too scared of the KGB. Well, for so, good um, reason, right? I mean, you, what, what I think, yeah, but I think a reason. lot of members of our audience may have never known or maybe have forgotten, you know, you did not cross the KGB. Like, these were not good guys. No, no, no. Yeah. You could go to prison for that. So I'm just saying here, Kale, with our situation, when we, when you created a system in academia, in media, mm -hmm. wherever, where People who tell you what you don't want to hear, who mm -hmm. contradict the official line, could be severely punished for it. You are creating a system that gives you no information that you need to protect the health of the system. This is what we are seeing now to go back to how we started, like with the Africans telling me that, um, you know, America isn't generating so much bad will among Africans for its cultural imperialism on sex, sex and sexuality right. issues. They were, they said at the same time that a lot of us Africans are turning to China. China's super active in Africa, yeah. uh, not because they think China is great, but because China's not going to mess with them. China's going to respect their local mores. Well, and what's so fr frustrating to me about that is, and you know, you talk about this a lot, you, you blogged about it this morning, you know, the, the law of merited impossibility, you know, that will never happen. And when it does, you bigots will have deserved it. And what's so frustrating to me about our, our elite, sorry, my light just went off. Hopefully I'm okay here. What's so frustrating to me about our cultural production, you know, unit of, of, of our ruling classes is that they cannot imagine that you could be against, you know, whatever, call it gay rights or LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus A, you know, they, they, um, except by um, motivated animus. What's the line yeah. from the from the Supreme Court? You know, that 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 in other words, you the only irrational reason animus, irrational animus. Yeah. 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 Keep going. Yeah. You know, the yeah. irrational animus. And it's like, or, or maybe there's a reason you haven't, maybe there's something you haven't figured into the mix here. Mm -hmm. and, and we seem incapable of that level of empathy or something. You know, it's, we just assume, you know, uh, and for all the crap that somebody like Fukuyama takes for his end of history bit, which is also a little bit of a, an unfortunate, he gets sort of um, cartooned uh, with it. Mm -hmm. But but all of us are sort of part of this bubble in which we can't imagine that not everybody on the planet is exactly like us. You know, these yeah. we, we weird people, Western, educated, you know, you know that, that act. Industrialized, rich, and democratic. Yeah, we yeah. can't imagine that everybody doesn't either is either not us or doesn't want to be us. Yeah. And why don't those people in Louisiana just move? Just move. It's yeah. the same. No, but it's the same. It no, you're exactly right. It it, exactly. It's the exact same thing. And, and it's like, you know, I, I always, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, but you always have to hold like a little bitty spot, a little placeholder for, for, you know, when, when you think through situations or when you argue through situations and you're trying to figure out what to do or what is true, right? When you're trying to make sense out of the world, a little tiny space that maybe I don't know something. Yep. Maybe, well, maybe there's something I'm not considering. Just a little bit. And we seem completely incapable of that level of s the smallest of the small amounts of humility. We yeah, seem incapable. No, no, we know it all. We know it all. I remember um, like 20 years ago or so um, uh, talking about when gay marriage first started going as a, as a big issue yeah. in this country, you know, making the point that uh, the people who say, well, I don't know how my neighbor's gay marriage is going to affect my marriage. Yeah. I'm like, right. I'll tell you why. And I wasn't mm -hmm. the only one doing it. There were other people saying why. Um, they weren't, we weren't given any space in the media to do it. You know, we were all... It was all bigotry. If you think yeah. that that is going to affect it, 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 it's then you must just be an irrational bigot. Um, as and look, that, and that, bigot. and that, that canard has won the day. It, of course, it has. And um, you know, we weren't listened to. And I know, I think uh, either the people in the media did not deliberately ignored us because they they wanted to see gay marriage and they didn't want anything that got in the way of the narrative that yeah. might keep us might delay it from being heard. 
or they just didn't want to think past it themselves. But yeah. people like me pointed out, and legal scholars pointed out, even someone like uh, Chai Feldblum, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. a lesbian activist, she said the same thing. Yeah. You can't have religious liberty, full religious liberty, and full LGBT rights it, it, when the religion in question uh, it contradicts LGBT rights. So uh, here we are today, uh, as you and I are, um, are talking, I just was blogging on um, a, a Catholic school in North Carolina uh, was found by a federal judge to have uh, uh, gone against or to have punished unfairly a gay man. Uh, he had been a substitute teacher at the school, but when he announced that he was marrying another man, the Catholic school fired him. He filed a federal lawsuit and the judge ruled against the school. Right. And, um, you know, I just, I'm not a legal scholar. I know this might shock you to hear, but I, I read. You know, I, I, when I first heard this, I was really angry at the judge because I think this is a bad ruling. But I read the ruling, yeah. and it, it seems to my layman's eyes like the judge didn't have much of a choice here, given the Bostock ruling by the Supreme Court, which is, I think, was a very bad ruling and a radical ruling. But mm -hmm. anyway, the Catholic school in North Carolina, it um, apparently was how to put this. He's, the judge said that if there had been a different set of facts, a slightly, his quote was a slightly different set of facts, he would have ruled for the school. But yeah. the school did not make a point of saying that its teachers teaching these classes should teach religion, you know? And, uh, right. and I guess the, my, the, Upshot here. It's the is ministerial the, exception that I think from is from Hosanna is Tabor, at. right? And so I guess the upshot here is that Catholic schools, other Christian schools that are Catholic or Christian in name only, mm -hmm. they're, the day is over for them. They're not going to pass. You have got to be affirmatively engaged in teaching the faith in your school or you're not going to be able to discriminate like this. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I got an email from a, a lawyer friend who said he thinks the judge still made the wrong decision, but he said Bostock was a truly revolutionary um, ruling. It was the one that said... Well, Robbie, yeah, remind our audience what, what Bostock found. Yeah, basically said that uh, anytime there is sex discrimination... Um, it inevitably takes in um, sexual orientation and gender identity, mm -hmm. which is uh, as about as close as you can come without the Equality Act being passed to writing uh, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI, as they call it, yeah. into federal civil rights law. Right. So um, the First Amendment does protect uh, religious uh, institutions, um, but this greatly narrows the the range of First Amendment protection for religious institutions. And the fact that according to the judge, this school did not see this particular teacher as being a quote unquote minister, not just a priest, but a minister, uh, because he didn't have to talk about Catholic doctrine, the school got popped. Well, you know, it's still unfortunate, but think about Catholic High where you went to school here in Baton Rouge and think yeah. about so many Catholic schools and other Christian schools that you know, formally say that we're not on board with LGBT, yep. but don't actually do anything about it. It's kind of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Right. Well, guess what? Those days are over now. Yeah. You know, that that I think that, you know, we can get into the whole legal stuff. You know, I'm not a lawyer either. I'm My brother is and my dad was. And anyway, you know, but to me, this is more interesting insofar as it is, it, it, it kind of draws uh, attention to the accommodationist uh, imperative that Catholic schools in the United States of America, at least, have made with, uh, you know, the world, have made with the kind of liberal establishment order um, that... You know, we're basically, you know, the idea here, and this has been true for my entire life, because this is certainly what it was like when I was in school. Um, the idea, you know, the mainstream Catholic idea was that, look, math class is math class, English class is English class, etc. But religion class is like the Catholic thing. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's this sort of these dividing lines that you sort of mentally erect, you um, you know, and in part, this is a sales pitch to the non-Catholic 
uh, a potential constituency, right? Don't worry, you know, Mrs. Jones, um, chemistry class is chemistry class. And, you know, don't worry, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Jones, that, that, you know, English class is just English class. And I think this is an impoverished view of what a Catholic education or sort of a Mm-hmm. fully Christian education um, should be um, and and is rarely uh, the case, right? So that, you know, like I don't teach religion. I don't teach, I'm not a theology per, uh, teacher. But every, my, my, you know, my entire worldview is informed in, in, in what I believe to be true about the world and, and each other. And right. I very much see myself as a quote unquote a minister of the mission of the school. And but you can see why, you know, it was very attractive to sort of do this um, you know, this hyper uh, compartmentalized conception because you can mm-hmm. get more people into the admission uh, pipeline if you don't sure. sort of overplay the Catholic thing or overplay the Christian thing. And yeah, well, I think if, this is coming to bite people in the ass. If your goal as principal of the Catholic school is to form good middle class citizens, Catholic citizens who go tailgate at the LSU game and who mm-hmm. give money to the church and, mm-hmm. you know, who go to the Knights of Columbus and things like that, and th- then you may not want to form. The, these kids to take strongly Catholic positions in ways that go against the, the, the middle-class standards of morality that are evolving. And, right. and that being the case, we now know the federal courts are going to hold you to that. Like, I think I, my, yeah. my wife teaches at uh, a non-denominational Christian school, the mm-hmm. classical school here in Baton Rouge. And um, they don't teach Christian literature. They don't teach Christian right. chemistry and all that. Right. Right. But as you were mentioning, the, the the Christian ethos, committed Christian ethos, is everywhere in that school. Uh, this this man, uh, Lonnie Billard, I think his name was, mm-hmm. the gay man who got fired. Mm-hmm. He was a he taught drama and literature. Mm-hmm. Well, there is. I mean, you could teach Christian literature, but they, you know he was teaching literature. It, 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 it misses the point, right? It misses right, right. the point. Well, in, in drama technique, there's not a Christian drama technique, right. but there is a clearly a way you can talk about drama and literature within a broad Christian worldview. What does literature, what does drama right. teach us about who the human person is? Well, How right. do we as faithful Christians c- interpret this sort of thing? And uh, But if the school, as this Catholic school in North Carolina, according to the facts of the case in the, in, in the judge's ruling, if it explicitly said, yeah, this isn't religious, religion is for religion class, yep. then it undermined itself. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, that's exactly, you know, because, you know, you know, um, dare, you know, we shan't dare be conceived of as being odd or weird in the public square. Right. And this is, you know, you I, look, you and I've been banging on about this since episode like three. Be weird. It's important. And most people just do not want to be weird. This goes back to your Benedict option stuff. You know, look, mi- you know, when you talk about, you know, to be a good middle class Catholic, let's just say to use that as an example. Which one? Which which one is it going to be? Because at the end of the day, there's a tension there. That is going to force you to make a choice between my middle class. Look, my middle class values in 1971, fine, whatever. Middle class values in 2021, mm, that's that's that you know that's that cultural shift that you know that you've chronicled for for much of your your career here. And so, okay, you know, family in 2021, you want to have a a, you know a raise a good middle class child. What if those middle class values all of a sudden are in direct conflict with the values you purport to hold as a Catholic Christian? Well, and here's the thing too. This is guess which I, guess which one loses. Guess which yeah, one? Yeah. Well, and uh, among a lot of middle class Catholics, I bet in that school in North Carolina, I bet that there were a lot of middle class tuition paying Catholic parents. Who thought the school did the wrong thing here who are fully willing to support the gay teacher yeah. because this is what it means to be middle class now middle class morality mm-hmm. has shifted mm-hmm. um i i think that probably most of the churches if not all of the churches in my hometown small town the deep south by the time i get to be an old man all of these churches will probably be backing gay marriage sure, because 
that's what middle class morality demands. And it's one thing when it's abstract, when, um, you know, gay marriage, of course, we don't like that. But what happens when it's the son or daughter of one of the old families in town, not even a rich family, just an yeah, old, family, old family. And the family has decided, you know what? We want to stand by Jane or Jeremy yeah, a, right. and help them find love. It's going to be real hard for a pastor to take a stand against that if he doesn't have these people with him. Well, indeed, and, and my 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 good friend, my good uh, you know internet friend, uh, Pastor Paul Vanderclay, uh, just put out a video this morning that I haven't had a chance to make my way through, but he sort of titles it provocatively, um, you know that uh, that that. Uh, marriage equality will be the death of protestantism now he's a protestant minister and so he's yeah. you know so he's he's um seeing you know but but he's but he's looking deeply at the logic of marriage equality and why um uh what what this will ultimately mean in terms of the unraveling his argument will be since i've exchanged messages with him his argument will be on some level and i say this with zero relish as a roman catholic so just audience please understand where i'm coming from you know paul's a proud you know reform a member of the christian reformed church and you know and, and, and god bless him but he's saying that there's an the the internal logic of um, liberalism is essentially the internal logic of Protestantism. And because Protestantism has shifted the locus of authority from uh, uh, church structures and, and whatnot, it's ultimately going to be um, uh, the tyranny of um, auto, the tyranny of uh, auto interpretation, right? It's like, yeah, well, what yeah, do you yeah. think, right? And, and you know, that's the the potential anarchy of all uh, unchecked, you know, Protestantism. Because as we know, and look, this is what ultimately un, undid uh, the liberal Protestant establishment in this own in, in our own country is that you know that you know as soon as, as long as they could sort of ground it in the reality of Scripture. We're fine. But what happens when the groundings of Scripture get blown up vis-a-vis -vis the higher criticism, et cetera, et cetera, and then vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Darwin? Well, then you've got nothing. You there, there is no more authority because you can just make Scripture mean whatever you want it to mean. And we're seeing that play out, right, Rod? Of course, of course. And it's happening in the Catholic Church and no right. doubt in the Orthodox Church, yeah, too. Yeah, right, right. It's so, 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 you know, right. And that's why I, I, I preface the, 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 my, my, my rant here with with look you know these very same forces have have found purchase in our respective uh confessions as well yeah, our yeah. churches as well I, uh, just just this week i saw that archbishop wilton gregory of washington yeah. is he now cardinal gregory he is cardinal he, yeah. he is Car yeah. cardinal gregory of yeah. washington uh was asked at the national press club about uh, joe biden catholic president supporting De abortion devout rights. catholic devout catholic joe biden oh, please get, get it right get it right yeah, yeah. um supporting abortion rights. And um, Gregory said, well, he's not representing Catholic teaching, but I think Gregory goes on to give some waffle words, like there's some debate, discussion among theologians. And I listened to that and I thought he might, uh, trying to parse his words carefully, he's being technically correct and maybe in some ways, but the fact is, yeah, there's debate among theologians. There are those who are faithful to the Catholic tradition and those who aren't. That's so, right. But That's this right. Was Where is about, Dante when you need him? Where is Dante when you need him? This is all about, you know, middle-class respectability, preserving access to power and yeah. so on and so forth. We know this. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, and look, so, and, and that, that, that is the, that is the through line, right? I mean, the through line is, is, is is the sort of the worship of power um you know look i i, I want to tell you this the Go greatest ahead. the greatest enemy of people like you and me who want to hold firm to our religious commitments even when they run in the face of the world are going to be our co-religionists because the fact that we do what we do um, makes them feel bad. And so they have got to destroy uh, us, make sure we're destroyed personally and professionally mm -hmm. to protect themselves, to protect themselves from this feeling of guilt they have that maybe they aren't living up to um, to what the religion, the faith expects of them. I just, I still don't understand the end game. You know, uh, something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, Rod, is, um, I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but uh, uh, C.S. Lewis's The Inner Ring, Oh yeah, yeah. That's and a great idea. you know, I think that continues to 
help me understand when I'm fr when I'm frustrated in trying to figure out people's motivations and it doesn't make sense on paper. I find that I, I have Lewis chirping in my ear. This is the inner ring, Kale. This is the inner ring. People uh -huh. want to be in the inner ring. And so uh, I reread a novel this summer. Actually, I re-listened to. I, I, I did one of those audible things. Um, a, a book I hadn't read in 25 years, I think. It's C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength. Right, and it's, it's right. A, really, it's, a, it's the third part of the Space Trilogy. But it's really quite different from the first two um, um, uh, the, the the first two volumes of the trilogy, and it's it, it, it kind of works on a standalone basis, but it really gets into what this inner ring business is and mm -hmm. why it's such a a powerful and potent thing, and it's ultimately uh, it's 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 a tension right. that he'll argue at the end of the book is part of all you know. It's always. Britain versus Logers. So Britain is being sort of the power of the world and Logers being the, the sort of this still small voice of, of a different kind of authority. And I just feel that this thing continually, that pattern plays itself out. So you think of somebody like Gregory and, you know, and the reason why I invoke Dante here is like, can you imagine what Dante would do with a, with, with a character like Wilton Gregory? You know, yes, I can. No, you can. Of course, you can. You can because uh, you don't have to remind the audience that you're a you're a fan and uh, you wrote a whole well, book no, about I, that, Dante. That's some of the things that the hypocrisy. Dante was a faithful Catholic, but right. he, the hypocrisy of the hierarchy and uh, whew, he was murdered. Oh. Oh. Yeah, and so you know, the only thing that can make sense out of you know, look, Wilton Gregory knows what the church teaches. Wilton Gregory knows that Joe Biden is playing fast and loose with this devout Roman Catholic garbage he knows this so what is he trying to do well he wants to be in the game he wants to be flattered he wants to be held in high esteem you know i mean this is the only way that you can make sense out of it yeah. because it's it's just so fundamentally dishonest at its core yeah. you know i know we're coming to an end yeah. here but i want you talked about Christians need to be weird and be yeah. proud of it. I did something really weird in Italy, weird uh -huh. and Christian this week. Yeah. Um, I went on my last days there on a pilgrimage to a little oh, yeah. church in the middle of nowhere in Tuscany. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you what happened there. It was, I, I went in pursuit of St. Galgano. Hmm. Um, readers of my blog know that about three years ago, a, uh, I was on my last Benedict Option speech at the book tour in Italy. I was in Genoa. After my speech was over, this man, an older man, approached me, and his English wasn't very good, but he said, Sir, I'm an artist and a Catholic. I was praying today, and I felt the Holy Spirit told me to come give you this. And um, he handed me a drawing that he had done, and it was of a saint kneeling down in front of a of a of a sword and a stone. I thought, Excalibur, what's this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, it's, it's St. Galgano. And I, I didn't know who that was. I thanked him for it and went on my way. I Googled it and sound St. Galgano was a, a, a Tuscan lower from the lower nobility mm -hmm. in the 12th century. And he was uh, known for being very passionate and violent. His mother prayed like crazy for his conversion. She asked St. Michael, the archangel, you know, the great warrior, to uh, come on, help help me out, help yeah. bring him bring him around. Galgano, as a young man, had a dream of Saint Michael, and Saint Michael said, "Put your sword down, come follow Christ." And Galgano wouldn't do it. So one day, Galgano is riding near this uh, steep hill there in rural Tuscany, and his horse takes him to the top of the hill. He doesn't want to go, but the horse takes him there, and he gets to the top, and there is Jesus standing with Mary and the apostles, and. Christ says, put your sword away and follow me. Galgano is so arrogant, he actually argues with Jesus. <laughs> he said, it would be easier for me to put this sword in the stone than to leave the world. Yeah. He brought the sword down onto the stone and it goes in almost up to the hilt. Wow. He left, Galgano immediately repented. He left the world. He followed Christ. He built a little hut there on top of where the sword and the stone was and became a hermit. He ended up becoming, to make a long story yeah. short, like a miracle worker and a healer. People would go to him for prayer and all that. And when he died, um, the bishops and abbots went to his funeral and they immediately opened a cause for, for his uh, sainthood. Yeah. He was the first 
figure in Catholicism to die and his cause be, for saint to be brought forward after the Vatican had adopted some new, very strict rules about, uh, about who's going to get made a saint. Sure. In other words, they had to send a cardinal up there to do a serious investigation. Mm -hmm. The cardinal in, uh, investigated the sword and the stone, couldn't figure it out what, what it was, that it was, must be a miracle. He interviewed people who knew him, including his mother. They declared him a saint in, I think, 1185. Okay. Um, you can still go today, Cale, to see the church that they built around the sword and the stone, which is there. That's amazing. And that's what I went to see, because it's been, I've been haunted by yeah. this since yeah. it got... And uh, I went up there and, and climbed the top of the hill, and you go in, and there is a sword and the stone. And mind you, the um, the Italian scientists about 20 years ago investigated it, probably figuring it was a fake. Sure, they sure. x-rayed it. The sword is down in that That's rock. Amazing. And um, they investigated, they, they tested the metal of the, the blade. It's 12th century. Wow. That yeah. thing has been there for that long. That's amazing. So uh, I just, all I did was pray there in front of this miracle for God to show me his will mm -hmm. and for me to have the courage uh, to plunge whatever my own sword is into the stone of faith mm -hmm. to surrender my own passions, everything to following Christ uh, and not to not to be so intimidated by my own weakness yeah. uh, as Galgano was. I, in other words, I want to have the faith that Galgano did not. I don't want to have to see a miracle before I do <laughs> what I do. Yeah. And I, I bring all this up now at the end of our conversation, because this is what we all have to do. All of us today are called to be, uh, if, we're, if we're faithful Christians or faithful uh, Jews, faithful Muslims in some ways, we are going to be called to go against the world. Uh, no matter what it costs us. Um, a lot of us might feel as Galgano did that, you know, it would be easier to put a sword in the stone than to leave the world. But guess what? We can do it with the help of God. And uh, in fact, this whole sword in the stone thing, that's where the whole King Arthur legend of Excalibur came from, mm -hmm. because this all happened in Tuscany uh, a couple of centuries before the legend of King Arthur was started appearing in English literature. So, uh, but this is real. It really happened. So um, I, I just bring that story up to say that um, this St. Galgano in some ways might be a saint for we of this era who feel faint of heart, feel that we're too bound to the world to be brave and to surrender everything for the sake of living in truth. But well, because, we because, because everything pulls against you. I mean, nobody wants to be weird unless you're, you know, kind of that's your kink or something. But I mean, then you, you want to fit in, like you want to go along with people. You want to, you know, have fellowship. And I guess the thing that I struggle with the most is, all right, Lord, I know that you want me to be weird. I know that it's important, but like how and when, like, you know, am I just sort of staking out a position just to be weird? Cause I, you know, I, yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. being reactionary or, 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 or is this where you're asking me to be weird? I, I, yeah. I, I struggle with this. Um, and I really do. I, I don't know, you know, oh. obviously the answer is to pray more, Kale, because you're not praying enough, you know. Well, if, if here, here's things. the thing that um, I was reading this guy, Philip Sherrod, who's an Orthodox um, writer, not a theologian. He wrote about theology. Mm -hmm. He made the good point that we can only really hear the voice of God if we have been practicing our living in such a way that our senses are tuned to the voice of God, right. you know, and you know, we can't, a lot of us are always praying. I'm certainly always praying for God to show me his will, but do I, am I expecting the, the skies to open up and an, an angel to come down and tell me or have a vision like Galgano did? Mm -hmm. It doesn't usually work that way. If we're not doing simple things like, you know, going to mass or the liturgy or to mm -hmm. church, if we're not doing daily prayer and things like that, then we're not going to be able to hear, hear the call. We're not going to have that discernment to know when we're called to be weird for, yeah, that's, you know, there's, there's too much noise and not enough signal, right? And that's because mm -hmm. we're not tuning out the noise, uh, yeah. uh, metaphorically and perhaps literally as well. So well, and Kierkegaard said that a night of faith is somebody you can't really see. They, they look like an, ever, an ordinary person, but yeah. they are surrender, have resigned themselves completely to following God, to following Jesus. And, um, but they don't they'll make a big deal of it. They just mm -hmm. do it. And uh, I think that you know, these are the kind of people who are these hidden saints that I hope that uh, they start coming forward or more of us who know that we're not that 
Yeah. But would, would need to be that start paying more attention to those people who are like that in our lives and modeling ourselves after their everyday courage. They're probably not going to be the kind of people you find uh, running companies or you know, running big law firms. And they're probably down there at the checkout, you know, checking you out for your groceries right. or right. coming in to spray your house for bugs, things like that. Yeah. All right. Well, Rob, man, it is great to have you back here stateside. Um, I'm looking forward to keeping this going with you. We start school here uh, on Monday. Uh, I know people down south have already been in school for a couple of weeks now, Uh but we start. So it's exciting. I'm reading Dante right now. And we've elected to uh, read uh, the Purgatorio uh, with the the kids um, uh, and not do Inferno. So oh, I'm actually good, looking good, forward yeah. to that. Yeah. No, I, I, I love Inferno, of course, but, but Purgatorio really is where it's at. Yeah. And so really looking forward to that. And I've been watching some cool things and reading some cool things that we need to catch up on. So, uh, but anyway, more on that later. Uh, okay. Rob, why don't you, why don't you send us out, brother? Don't get nothing on you. <laughs>